if you're a little skeptical, you'd be saying, you should be saying, yes, Werner, that's all a bunch of more concepts. I gotta go out and ride the bicycle on Monday. What, what is today? No, I have to go out and ride the bicycle Thursday. Don't, I don't wanna hear a, I don't wanna read a book on riding the bicycle. Get me a bicycle. I got the balance on the bicycle tomorrow at work. So now, it's time to learn something about this domain. I want you to know, remember I told you I wanted to talk in that little place in the whole realm of communication where the talking actually made a difference? When I say talking, I mean communicating, talking and listening, where it makes a difference? That little place where talking and listening makes a difference is called, I call coaching. To distinguish it, from the stories about it and the explanations about it and all of the rules about it and all the beliefs about it and all, and all that stuff. So whether you can make the distinction or not, you and I have been communicating at a coaching level. Not at an explanatory level. I'm not interested in explanation here tonight. That's not my field. My field is not explanation, it's generation. My field is coaching, not journalizing. Now, we should be very clear before anybody is stupid enough to dismiss this domain that it's a very important domain. This domain of representation, of content, of explanation, the domain of circumstances. Let me tell you just how important it is. You can't get out of this room without it. See, because outside this room is only a concept for you and me, isn't it? Nobody experiencing outside now. Outside is something represented in our mind, not actually being experienced by us. So we couldn't even get out of the room without the world of explanation, conceptualization, until somebody by accident fell against one of the doors. Then we could say, oh, hey, outside, I see it now. See, some nitwits, when they discovered that there was a realm of experience, said, we got to throw all that mind stuff and all that intellect away. Real stupid. Being half-assed is as bad whichever cheek you got left. All I'm saying is that you and I are very confident in this whole realm of conceptualization. We live in a culture and in a society which forces us to be confident in it in order to survive. So we know a lot about the realm of explanation, about the realm of, con of content, about the realm of conceptualization. We know enough about the experiential realm, the process realm, to at least be aware of it. We heard tell that there's this thing called love and satisfaction and wholeness and being complete and alive and there's this thing called happiness and there are people whose lives are turned on and they're, you know, we've heard tell. We've read the menu. <clears throat> but we have no capacity to communicate in the contextual domain. So this is all about that tonight. See, a lot of people are worried about following what I'm saying. If you follow what I'm saying, you haven't gotten anything. Well, it's okay to follow what I'm saying, but don't worry about following it. That isn't where the communication occurs. What you get, what I said. And if you don't, you didn't get whatever value there was here tonight. So you've got to create, you've got to generate, you've got to call forth that there is a domain of communication and knowledge which is generative. And that it's possible for you as a human being to call forth, to create. From where? From your experience? No! From your concepts? Absolutely not. 
Then from where? The answer is two answers. One answer is nowhere. Three answers. One answer is nowhere. The second answer is nowhere and everywhere. And the third answer is from yourself. Now, I'm just going to make an assertion. I'm going to make a statement. I'm not going to prove this. I'm not going to, I'm not going to communicate it. I'm just going to state it. It takes me 60 hours to communicate this. So I'm not going to communicate it tonight. But I am going to assert it. Until you know that who you are is empty and meaningless, you don't know anything. So I assert that until you know who you are is empty and meaningless, you don't know anything. Without knowing that, all things known are not known, but are only known to some end. Like everybody knows everything they know for a reason. They don't just know anything. And you can't know anything until you know that who you are is empty and meaningless. Now, that, look, that's a very stupid thing for me to say and leave like that. It's only going to bother people. So I'm stupid and you're bothered. <laughs> but you see, until you get yourself as a space without meaning and without content, until you get yourself as a space without meaning, without content, there's no self from which to come. There's an identity from which to come, who you think you are, what you believe in, what you stand for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera all that, your position. But until you know yourself as that without meaning, and that without content, you have literally, you are without nothing from which to come. You've lost the nothingness which you must have in order to create your own life. So like I said, that's a 60-hour discussion. We're going to leave that one aside. I should tell you the other half of it. You know, like a hand has a front and a back, it's still a hand. But if you keep slicing off the front, the instant the, you get the last slice of the front, the back disappears at the same time. So they're inseparable. So when I say who you are, when I say no one knows who they are until they know that who they are is empty and meaningless, that's the front of the hand. The back of the hand is who you are is the stand you take on yourself. Literally, who you are is the context you've created for your own life. And a context is always and only created. It's never inherited. It's never a matter of learning. It's never a matter of something you picked up. It's never a matter of accident. It's never a matter of habit. Always and only something created. The stand you take in yourself, the context for your life, for your life is always and only created. Most people don't have a context, they only have a condition. The condition is a this vicious circle. That's the condition in which most of us live our lives. We live our lives from conceptually derived, our experiences are conceptually derived, and our concepts are reinforced by those conceptually derived experiences. And we change all the time, and we think that that's life. We keep changing. We get older and smarter. We think that that's life. That isn't life. That isn't life. That is not life. That's not being alive. Change is not life. Rocks change. Life, being truly alive, is creative and generative, 
One creates one's own life. How? Very simple. By making a distinction called the domain of creation. You see, because generation, context, communication at this level is nothing more complex than drawing a distinction. A realm is brought into being by drawing a distinction. And by knowing that the realm you've brought into being is neither experience nor content. So, you go home to your wife, walk in the door and say, how do I feel? Do I love her? God, I hope I do. Because i got to live with her. And i got to act like I love her. I hope the feeling's there. I hope the experience is there. See, and then people get to the point where they can't keep living with the circumstances when the experience isn't there. They don't know how to get out of it. They don't know what to do about it. They don't know how to, they don't know how to fix it. There's no fixing it in the vicious circle. See, it's possible, it takes an enormous amount of courage, but it is possible to create the context of love for your relationship. When? Now? Where? Here? How do you do it? You don't do it by looking into the circumstances. You don't do it by looking into your feelings. You do it as an existential, self-expressive act. You call into existence a context of love in which you hold both your experience and your circumstances. And in that context, the experience, the process of your relationship begins to reflect the context which you've created for it. And that process, that action, begins to move the circumstances around until finally you've got an experience and circumstances that match the context you've created. I know you can't follow that. I know it doesn't make any sense. You want to make a difference in life? You want to stop just being concerned with what's important, like what people think of you, and what your position is, and how much money you got, and your, and your posture in the community, and what you believe in, and all that other stuff that ultimately doesn't make a difference, but it's important. You want to play in the realm of difference making? That very, actually I could have my fingers closed. You want to play in that realm of difference making? Then you need to be willing to take a stand. That's something you can prove. And you ain't going to get any applause for it either. I'm going to read you three more quotes quickly, just so you're not looking for applause. You want monuments. You want agreement. You want titles. You want recognition. This is the wrong domain to function in. Stay down here in the vicious circle and get a good game going. But if you want the monument of having made a contribution to the quality of life, then this is the domain. Albert Einstein said, great spirits have always encountered violent, violent opposition from mediocre minds. He knew that from experience. This is a quote from a tomb of a man who had a great impact on our civilization says, there is nothing more difficult to take in hand, more perilous to conduct, or more uncertain in its success than to take the lead in the introduction of a new order of things. Finally, this is a piece of literature. This is a poet talking. The great things of life are what they seem to be. 
And for that reason, strange as it may sound to you, are often very difficult to interpret. I say explain. Great passions are for the great of soul, and great events can only be seen by those who are on a level with them. We think we can have our visions for nothing. We cannot. Even the finest and most self-sacrificing visions have to be paid for. Strangely enough, that is what makes them fine. So, what did all this mean tonight? Nothing. Wasn't meant to mean something. Wasn't meant for you to go out with a rule. Wasn't meant for you to go out with something to remember. Wasn't meant that tomorrow, when you get into a certain situation, you say, oh, I remember, he said do this. Wasn't meant that when you have a discussion tomorrow with your friends that you have some smart, new, slick things to say. You try talking about this stuff and see how smart and slick you come out. <laughs> now let me tell you where I measure the validity of our being together. I measure the validity of our being together and the quality of your life over the next few weeks. I don't measure it in whether you like what God said or not. I don't measure it in whether you remember what God said or not. I don't measure it in whether you understood what God said or not. I measure it in the quality of your life over the next couple of weeks. So I have a few things to say in leaving. One of the things is a real, honest to God, thank you. I mean, I really mean thank you. First off, thank you for your time and your attention. That's always a gift. Nobody owes their time or attention. But something much more fundamental, something much more powerful than that. You know, I really want to thank you for being here. I have to say here because that's English. I actually mean I want to thank you for being. This has been very real for me tonight, being with you. The opportunity to be together, to have a relationship, to communicate to share ourselves. See, I did all the talking. That's unfortunate. I hope that the real action was not going on in what you were looking at up here, but was going on in what you were creating for yourself, what you were generating for yourself. I wish I were better able to communicate my, the depth of my gratitude for the opportunity that you've created for, uh, for us. This has been a privilege for me and a great gift. Thank you very much and good night. Is uh, I think I mentioned having a magic wand, and if I didn't mention having a magic wand, I now mention to you having a magic wand. Uh, people say, well, how do you create this space of ecstasy? You know, how do you bring this ecstasy, this joy, this uh, pleasure as an expression of love, this wholeness, this completion, this uh, unconditional love into the relationship, and you do it by waving a magic wand. I mean, obviously, there's no other way to possibly do it. Uh, so I want to tell you about the magic wand. What I want to tell you about the magic wand is that in the ordinary course of events, in order to bring something about, you need to establish a process. I'll just repeat myself. In the ordinary course of events, in order to bring something about, you need to establish a process. In other words, in order for me to get from here to there, I can't do it all at once. I have to do it one step at a time. And by handling it one step at a time, I can, as a matter of fact, be from here to there. So all I need to do is to be willing to establish a process, to manufacture a process, to, to produce a process. And by a process, I can, in fact, accomplish something. Now, that's the ordinary space in which we live. There is, there is however, an extraordinary space 
in which we also live. I want to be clear that I didn't say to you that there's an extraordinary space which you can achieve. Let me be very clear that I did not say that there's an extraordinary space which you can achieve. I said that we live both in the ordinary space and we live in this extraordinary space. But it's like having the keys to an automobile in your pocket. If you don't ever go out and put it in the ignition, you don't get to drive the automobile. It isn't enough that the automobile is there. You actually have to know about it and use it. So I want to turn you on to a quality of the space in which you live, which could be called the extraordinary quality. And that is that at the base of it all, fundamentally, what so is so by your consideration alone. Now, for most of it, you have to deal with it in the ordinary way. In other words, with respect to this chair, which is really rather ordinary stuff, I have to deal with this in an ordinary way. In order to accomplish something, in order to achieve something with the chair, I need to set up a process. So that if I want to take the chair away with me, I have to take the back off and fold the arms up, fold the legs up, and then I can take it away with me. But I have to do this one, two, three, four, five, six, you know, this linear progression, this progressional thing in order to achieve something with the chair. However, there are, there, there, it is also that in the space in which you live, much of what is there is a function not of any process, but as a function of your consideration alone. That is to say, whether this chair is good or bad is a function only of your consideration. At any rate, a great deal of what exists in our life exists as a function of our consideration. If you consider it to be so, it's so. If you consider, listen, by the wave of a wand, if you consider that I love you, I love you. Now, you may not be able to consider me down there on the floor standing next to you. It may be that that's the part of your life that works in the ordinary way. Because that's pretty ordinary standing next to someone. To be loved is extraordinary. And it's a function of the extraordinary space. And it happens as a function of your consideration alone. By merely considering that I love you, I love you. So you've got this universe in which you can create by consideration alone. I call that the magic wand. And it is the, it is the instrument by which one creates this ecstatic quality in one's relationship. You imbue the relationship with ecstasy. You create in the relationship ecstasy. Now I caution you that you cannot create in opposition to anything. Listen, you cannot create in opposition to anything. So that if there's something in the relationship which you would consider to be inconsistent with ecstasy, you can't create ecstasy in opposition to that thing. You can't say, it's horrible, but I'm going to make it ecstatic. I'm going to, this is not act as if. This is not pretend. This is not go through the motions. This is something far senior to that. So you can't consider, you can't create by consideration. You can't create by magic wand in opposition to anything. You can, however, include anything in that which you create. So to create ecstasy, in your relationships does not mean that any particular thing has to be in your relationship or not in your relationship. There can be any circumstance 
and any condition presently existing in your relationships, and you can wave the magic wand of ecstasy. As long as you're willing to include in the ecstasy, as long as you're willing for that circumstance or that consideration to be a function of the ecstasy, to in fact manifest the ecstasy, to express the ecstasy, and your willingness to allow any condition or any circumstance of your relationship to express the ecstasy is a part of the creation of the ecstasy. So one creates ecstasy by waving one's magic wand. One does not create ecstasy by doing something. I am ecstatic because I am ecstatic. I love you because I love you. It is so because you consider it to be so. So, to master this space, to master the space of ecstasy, to master the space of love, one must be willing to create by consideration. You need to be willing to do that. You need to be willing to create a context around the existing circumstances. And as you've heard from the people who've expressed it, it often takes a lot of courage. But what if it turns out that you were a fool? Well, fool is probably not down very far from where you are if you're worried about it. I mean, what the hell, it's probably worth taking the chance. You come out of this space, you rewrite all the sex manuals. Promise! All that technology about sex is based on attempting to get to ecstasy. They ain't seen nothing yet from people coming from ecstasy. No kidding. Honest. No kidding. I want to be clear about your expression as a sexual being transforming as a function of your willingness to come from ecstasy, to come from being whole and magnificent and complete, to bring to your sexual expression your own ecstasy instead of trying to get it out of it. So you need to be willing to wave your magic wand to create this ecstasy. To be, you know, you don't wait to go home to find out if this person that you live with now has got you absolutely blown away. No! You come from being blown away. See, you want to tell me how your relationships are. I don't give a damn how they are. That isn't what this is about. This is about where you're coming from. It's about who you are. It's about the context of the relationship, the space of the relationship. It doesn't make any difference how it is. At this level, you get to create how it is. And you can come out of this into your relationship. You come out of ecstasy into your relationship to create ecstasy. You come out of ecstasy, out of pleasure as an expression of love out of celebration, to create the experience of celebration and love and ecstasy. This is about lighting the fire, not warming yourself by it. Hi. Hello. How are you doing? Uh, 
Hello, Werner. Hello. <laughs> My name is Anna Lois. Thank you, Anna. And I haven't the slightest idea what I'm going to say. <laughs> I know and the I, feeling. I, I, uh, and I wanted to give myself the opportunity to be up here and create. Wonderful. And Werner, I love you, and I just love creating that. Yes, that's beautiful. That's <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Yay! <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Too big, too bright, too wonderful, too magnificent for most it people. It is. Oh, I love <laughs> it. Great. And I want you to know, though this includes this morning also, that this is the most validating experience of me, probably of my whole life, and I love it, and I got it. That's terrific. <laughs> Beautiful. You know, it reminds me, so it was such a perfect expression of that one poem I read by E.E. E. Cummings about all the wisdom being nothing when compared to, I think he talked about uh, a wink of your eye. Yeah, something about violets, that's right. But you know, it's very interesting. She got up there and she did exactly what I was talking about. I mean, she stuck her neck out. She was alive. She was real. She was magnificent. And she wasn't inhibited. She wasn't, you know, she wasn't inhibited by the normal things which people consider when they're doing that. Got to be coming from ecstasy. It's wonderful. You know, I, I can picture people's minds saying, but what will they think? Do you want me to tell you what they'll think? They'll think terrible things about you. <laughs> what the hell do you think they were going to think? They think terrible things about you anyhow. That's what thinking's about. It's about terrible things. <laughs> thinking's all about butts. You want to move them. You want to inspire them. You want to give them the opportunity to be in touch with and experience and express their own magnificence. The hell with what they think. You know, I don't mean put down what they think. I mean allow them to think it. Oh, what a wonderful expression of love that you doubt me. I mean, how I'm used to those usual expressions of love. You come up with something unusual. Let's not make that commonplace, however. No, that was beautiful. That was so, so remarkable. God damn. <laughs> What a love affair. Hi, over there. What is your Hi. name? My name's Kermit. Hi, Kermit. Yeah, and um, I had something I wanted to share, and that came out of uh, the relationship that I've had with you for a long time, and I've really been complete that that relationship is complete. <laughs> Beautiful. And I want to take the opportunity now to uh, voice something that came up for me today. Because it was complete, I thought that, well, why do I feel uncomfortable sometimes when uh, I get this sometimes experience I got today? And that was a little bit of overwhelm, a little threat. And I don't know if I got it all, but I got some part of it. And it looked like a resentment somewhere that in all my life, to get what I got, I seem to have to effort at it. And I seem to have to do something spectacular to get it. And this was free. 
<laughs> and, um, yeah, and uh, out of that, if I were to really acknowledge that, then I have to get clear that I have to, I'm going to acknowledge you personally for that gift, for being responsible for me putting that mirror up so I can look into it. That's beautiful, Kermit. And, uh, and again, it was just something, I mean, I'm having difficulty getting it out now, and that is that to give that acknowledgement to another man who, who was something that I was jealous of, I guess. And then to get the bottom line that I, that I got that from another man who was a white man, and I think at one point in time that made some kind of difference. Just wanted to get that off. Thank uh, you. Kermit, you know, it's uh, in the normal course of events, first off, I do want to acknowledge your courage and your honesty and your directness and your straightforwardness and your openness. And, uh, and I want to take then a little look a little bit deeper because I think that that really all comes as a function of recognizing your own magnificence. You know, when you take a look in your life, you've got lots of things to give away. To be able to give away your jealousy, to be able to give away your resentment, to be able to give away your prejudice, what an incredible gift to give that away. I really salute you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Listen, can you get it? It's easy to give away your love. You know, easy to give that away. Easy to give away your support and your appreciation. Very difficult to give away those things like jealousy and resentment and prejudice. Incredibly difficult. Enormous gift. Is it possible that you don't have something to contribute? Not possible. Yes. Hi, what's your name? Hi, Werner. My name is Jonathan. Good to see you, Jonathan. I really want, I really want you to get and everybody to get how utterly absurd, <laughs> ludicrous it is for me to be in a position where I could be up here acknowledging my feeling of relationship with you and my feeling <laughs> that I've gotten of your integrity and your caring and concern and your love. If you can imagine a place utterly contradictory of, yes. that, of that space, <laughs> a, a, a place of uh, uh, utterly mind-bound and, and, and totally rational and unwilling to come from that celebration, um, my halfway position that I'm at now would yeah, look so, like wild it, celebration to you. No, no, it's wonderful. I'm telling you, it's great because the bigger they are, the harder they fall, and you're really beautiful. You know, it's big enough to get out of, to get off of that space you were talking about. And you see, it's not that, you know, it, 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 what I'd like you to get is that coming from that kind of reserve and being big enough to get off that, not to give it up, but to be big enough to expand, to include the celebration, is just a remarkable, wonderful thing. So those of you who are stuck deeply, you've got something really beautiful to contribute. Thank you. Go on. It's great. Where I am is is, is this in 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 relationship. Uh, my mind is 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 chattering and yelling and fighting and going down screaming and you know, I'm, I'm willing to make that stab and commitment into coming from ecstasy and joy. And my mind keeps saying, "What does it look like?" And Werner says, "Well, it doesn't look like nothing." And but it's got to look like something. <laughs> and I have, I have this sense. There, my feeling of relationship with you, I get an analogy between 
your relationship with me and my relationship with my father and a woman in my life and others who I don't relate to or who won't relate to me, rather, in the sense that they won't play with me, that they will withhold and deny and not be intimate with me. And I just wonder what your experience is, how it looks to you and how it how it could look to me, where I come to them from that kind of um, love and acceptance, and there's no play on the other side. They yeah. won't play. Yeah, you see that? Look, I want you to know... There's that, no relationship. Well, okay. Let, I, the, I, you see, my answer is not at all complex. It's really very simple. And its power is not brilliance of the response but in the fact that what I'm about to tell you is very real. I'm telling you the truth. And I'm not telling you the truth just for me. I'm telling you what's really so about those people. I'm telling you that their inability to respond, their bound upness is the highest expression of love which they can muster. Now look, they may, you may be smarter than they are, they may be smarter than you are. You may be richer than they are, they may be richer than you are. You may be more clever, more communicable, they may be more clever, more communicable. None of those things, about none of those things can I speak. The one, or will I know the answer? About this I know the answer. They have the capacity for love. They have a capacity for love like yours and like mine, which is absolute. The only thing bound up in their life is the expression of that capacity. So what you're getting is a, is a bound expression of an absolute love for you. And if you can accept that as their love for you, and if you can be in ecstasy about that expression, if you can be joyful and celebrate that expression, your joy, your ecstasy, you're being blown away by your relationship with them, I promise you will provide the heat necessary to melt whatever's there. Miracles will happen. I just want you to know that I'm willing to come from there. Yeah, absolutely. I, I see I, it. I really, I, mean, I really look forward to to uh, going that extra. Man, you are so beautiful. You are so real. I can't tell how much I appreciate your sharing. Wonderful. I wanted to share with you where this came from. And I wanted to share with you where this was going because I think it creates a context around it that makes this context of ecstasy clearer and more meaningful. That is to say, what is the context of this context of ecstasy? What makes ecstasy possible? What allows for ecstasy is when your life is committed to a purpose larger than those things which are in your life. It's very interesting. And as you know, I've gotten a chance really to examine people's lives and a lot of people's lives about the intricacies of making life work, about the difficulties and intricacies. And there are these wonderful, complex, wonderful techniques and theories about how to make your life work, how to make it you know, actually work for you. And it's very interesting because all of the nonsense in your life is swept away when you commit your life to a bigger purpose than your life. Suddenly, you know, my neuroses are gone, my psychoses are gone. Now, it may be that I'm so stuck in my problems that I'm not able to commit myself to a bigger purpose. And I want to recognize the possibility of that and support the people who are in that position and transcending the problems and working their way through the problems. But for most of us, nothing more difficult, nothing more complex than to commit our lives to a purpose bigger than our lives is necessary to really shift the whole spectrum of the problems in our lives 
so that suddenly these problems are really not problems, they're simply additional things to deal with. I want to read a quote to you from George Bernard Shaw, which really sums up the sense which I have, this sense which I have about what makes life work for people ultimately. This is the true joy in life, the being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, the being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfish little clod of ailments and grievances complaining that the world will not devote itself to making you happy. I am of the opinion that my life belongs to the whole community, and as long as I live, it is my privilege to do for it whatever I can. I want to be thoroughly used up when I die. For the harder I work, the more I live. I rejoice in life for its own sake. Life is no brief candle to me. It is a sort of splendid torch, which I've got a hold of for the moment, and I want to make it burn as brightly as possible for before handing it on to future generations. And for me, that is the context of this context called ecstasy. It's the space from which it comes, and it's the place to which it's devoted. And it is what gives it meaning. It is what dignifies it. It is what sanctifies it. It's what makes it real. It's what makes it honest. It's what makes it tough. It's what makes it straightforward. It's what makes it love. I started off by reading poetry, and I want to finish by reading you one last poem. This is also from E.E. E. Cummings, who I want to acknowledge for his contribution to tonight. <laughs>